This is Truth Frequency Radio. The wicked ones obviously under heavy, heavy Masonic influence. <laughs> Behold the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio. And it is the day before Passover. And for those that um, honor the Enochian lunisolar calendar, you know that tomorrow is the full moon. Um, well, actually, the this Friday, today's, today's Thursday, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so it is this Saturday, is uh, which we had on the, I'm looking at the calendar, which we had on the 18th, Rosh Kadesh, which was on a Sunday, and that's Rosh Hashanah for the new year, the beginning of the spring season. And interestingly enough, even though they forecasted the vernal equinox to be on the 20th, um, according to time and date, the day and the night were divided in equal 12-hour portions on the 17th which, you know, the alignment of the lunar month as far as Nisan, the first month of the Hebrew calendar, which is the month of March, for us, or, or for those that follow the Gregorian solar calendar, that that usually happens in that particular, the month of Nisan happens in either March or April, depending on whether there's a 13th month and a dar two. And so um, this year, all of the Sabbaths will align with Sunday, interestingly enough. And so the Christians will actually be right for, well, four Sabbaths, but for five weeks, um, the new moon convocation and then the celebration of the first quarter Sabbath would be on the 25th of March. And then we have Pesach occurring on the 31st of March, which is the 14th of Nisan. In my opinion, we are in the 6,001st year. And this is the first month of the 6,001st year. And I can, for those that are interested in how I came to that determination, I can send you something out that speaks in greater detail on that. But then on the 1st of April, you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Shag Hamatzi, and it is also the full moon Sabbath. Even though the moon will be sort of full, almost full, tomorrow evening, they will hit complete fullness on the 1st. And then on the 2nd of April, Yom Hibbukrim, which is the Feast of First Fruits, is the 16th of Nisan, and that begins the counting of the Omer. And then you have for the following the Sabbath, because you have to count seven perfect weeks. You have the Sabbath of the 22nd on April the 8th. Then the Sabbath of the 29th, the Lunar Conjunctive Sabbath on the 15th of April. Then Rosh Kadesh on the 16th of April for the month of Iyar, which is the second month on the Hebrew calendar and the second month of spring. And you don't count that day in the counting of the Omer. And so on the 15th, which is the 29th of Nisan, the lunar conjunctive Sabbath, that is the 14th day of the Omer. 
but then you don't count Rosh Kadesh or the translation days because those days are not included in the seven day counts of what are the perfect weeks as listed in um, in the Enochian lunar solar calendar. And so you pick up the counting of the Omer with the second day of IR, which is the 17th of April. And then the Sabbath will align. And so you'll have the first quarter Sabbath on the 21st day of the Omer, the 8th of IR on the 23rd of April, and then on the 30th of April, which is my son's birthday. Shout out to Justin and Joy, still traveling and celebrating Passover in Jerusalem. Um, um, and then they'll be coming home sometime thereafter. But anyways, so on the 28th day of the Omer, the full moon Sabbath is on the 15th of IR, which is April the 30th. And then... You have on May the 7th, the third quarter Sabbath, the 22nd of Ayar, which is the 35th day of the Omer. And then on May 14th, the 29th of Ayar, the lunar conjunctive Sabbath, at the 42nd day of the Omer. Then you have a translation day, which for those that don't know, that's the 30th day of the lunar month. And you don't count that day in the seven day sabbatical count either. And so on the 14th of May, the 29th of IR, you have the 42nd day of the Omer. The next day on the 15th of May, that's the 30th of IR, translation day. Then you have Rosh Kadesh for the month of Savan, which is on the 16th of May, should be on the 16th of May. And then you continue the counting of the Omer with the first day of the week of the seven day sabbatical week, which follows Rosh Kadesh. And so on the on May 17th, you continue the count of the Omer. And so you have on the May 17th, the second day of Savan, the 40th day of the Omer. And this count will continue until what is May 23rd, which is the 8th of Savan. And for that is the seven Sabbath, seven Sabbaths from the day of first fruits. And so According to Leviticus 23, Pentecost or Shavuot, it's always counted. And so that would make it on the 9th of Sivan. And it always falls on the 9th of Sivan. And the 49th day of the counting of the Omer is on the 8th of Sivan, which is the first quarter Sabbath. And that's May 23rd. And so Shavuot will be on May 23rd. 24th, which is the 9th of Savan. And so I want to read really quickly uh, a short article that I wrote for our newsletter, the Sacred Word Publishing newsletter. For those that are not on it, you can contact Carol at sacredwordpublishing.net and she'll put you on the, the listserv um, where we keep you informed of the, the proper days and months uh, according to the Enochian calendar and also keep you updated on the different books that we have coming out and the information that we are releasing um, not more than twice a month and that's only if there's for instance you know the Pesach um, Passover being celebrated and I'll, this will give you an idea as to why and we should honor and celebrate the Levitical feast days rather than the pagan Constantinian holy days that most of mainstream Christianity is involved in. 
with regard to Christmas, Good Friday, um, things like that, which are completely pagan in origin. And so let me read this article. And this is also, you can find this on our Facebook group at Sacred Word Publishing. It says this. Recently, I focused in broadcast and work upon bringing a more in-depth understanding as to why followers of Yahuwah and the Son, Yahushua Christ, should observe the Levitical feast days rather than the Constantinian pagan holidays. Besides our being commanded in proclamation by the Father to maintain observance of these feast days and festivals forever, it is important to examine the historical implications of these particular dates on the lives of the patriarchs and the prophets to better understand their importance. When one comprehends the many connections of these dates to specific legendary occurrences, one will no doubt have a better appreciation as to why one should acknowledge celebration of them, especially since Pesach is slated to begin Friday, March 31st. The first of Titri. In my research, I have determined that not only were Adam and Eve expelled from paradise during the fall on the Feast of Trumpets, the first day of the Hebrew month of Tishri, this is, you know, the first of the fall feasts, which there are three. Um, there's three feasts in, in the seventh month, which is for us in uh, September, October, on the Gregorian calendar. And then three in the spring, in the month of March or April, the month of Nisan, and then one um, in the middle of summer. And so it is also believed by some that Yahushua was born on this particular day, 5,500 years after Adam and Eve's expulsion from the upper heavens. Likewise, for those that understand prophecy, it is foreordained that Christ, will return at the end of days and second advent from heaven on this date. The seventh trumpet and blast of the ram's horn by the archangel Michael, announcing that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord, is the selfsame moment whereby the angels as reapers are sent forth across the face of the earth to gather the harvest for reaping. It is then that those who are deemed worthy will be restored in bright nature to inherit entrance into New Jerusalem for what will be the millennial reign of our Lord and King here upon the earth. The terrors which ignored his commandment and in their lives sought out self-gratification and personal glory over obedience and dedication to Yahuwah will be punished in justification for the choices they rendered over a lifetime. A quote from the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 5. We fools accounted his life madness and his end to be without honor. How is he numbered among the children of God and his lot is among the saints? Therefore have we erred from the way of truth and the light of righteousness hath not shined unto us and the sun of righteousness rose not upon us. We wearied ourselves in the way of wickedness and destruction. Yea, we have gone through deserts where they lay no way. But as for the way of the Lord, we have not known it. What hath pride profited us? Or what good hath riches with our vaunting brought us? This is the, you know, the elite, those that are of the serpent bloodline, that even after all their lives of indulgence and good pleasure and uh, living above the law and doing as they wanted, they still, in the end, because they do not inherit salvation through Christ, what, what purpose did all of that have? It was meaningless. And they will, you know, pay... Um, the penalty of not having choice to make eternity a priority. The 15th of Nisan, which is Passover. 
Most interestingly, as I declared in presentation, the significance of the 15th of Nisan and the 1st of Tishri in a show that I just released uh, and which you can find on YouTube under Endeavor Freedom and Zen Garcia. The 15th of Nisan was not only the date whereby Moses liberated the Israelites from their enslavement in Egypt, it was also the date where Cain and Abel bring forth their initial offering to Yahuwah. The disagreement with Cain over whether there would be judgment for one's actions led in part to the murder of Abel. This fulfilled in prophecy the enmity spoken about in Genesis 3.15, Abel becoming the first casualty in the war between the bloodlines, the seed of the woman against the seed of the serpent. The 15th of Nisan was also the day that Abraham was called forth to leave the religion, land, and pagan gods of his father Terah and the high priest Nimrod, the high priest of Nimrod, the most powerful king of that day and time. This day would also mark the timing of Abraham's war with the kings of Sodom, liberating his nephew Lot. It was also on this date that the contention between Abraham and the kings of Shinar resulted in the climactic destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and three other cities in the land of Shinar. The 15th of Nisan was also the day that Sarah was taken by Pharaoh in attempt to wed her as wife. This date was also that day that Abraham was tested to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to Yahuwah, something which the Most High God would prophetically fulfill thousands of years later in offering Yahushua, the only begotten, as the Passover lamb without spot or blemish who according to John said of him, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Of course, there are many more dates of significance historically linked to these particular feast days and festivals, which memorialize the importance of these dates to not only the various patriarchs and prophets and apostles of Israel as God's chosen people, these dates would occur in special event over and over throughout the life of Adam and his descendants as people and nation, which is why I believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit themselves as creator of all things have mandated them in observance to us as their disciples. It is with that in mind that I hope I have piqued your interest enough for you to possibly take part in the privilege of our being able to observe and celebrate these particular holy days as they come to pass in the next few days and weeks. Yahuwah bless you in all of your seeking. And so with that, I'm going to, I want to finish up a text, a portion of a text that I went into last night, which was really a very heartfelt and deeply moving program and it was about a text called the gospel of Gamaliel which for those that have never heard of this text and may not know who Gamaliel was he was the brother of Nicodemus Nicodemus being the disciple of Christ who together with Joseph of Arimathea his uncle pleaded for the body of Yeshua when he was crucified on the cross. And he and Joseph spent the evening, Passover evening, up until almost the sunrise and the dawning of the Sabbath of the unleavened bread, preparing his body for burial and wrapping it in fine scents, myrrh and things of that nature, and aloe and spices. And, um, and then they entombed him in Joseph's garden tomb. And it was from there that he resurrected. And he even, according to the story that I shared last night, which we will be uploading within a few days, he had already told not only his disciples, but even the 
Pharisees knew, as did Pontius Pilate and all of the many of his followers and his di disciples and those that believed on him as being the true son of God, the Christ, the Savior Messiah, that he would resurrect. And so the Pharisees had put into place a conspiracy to have the guards lie and that they would bribe them with money to declare that the apostles stole him away in order to lead people astray and to keep them from believing on Christ as the true son of God. And, you know, this is what he had come here to fulfill, that his life was about a spiritual message, one that proves to us in faith that he truly is the way, the truth, and the light, and that it is through him that we can have a secure eternity and inheritance in the afterlife and a promise of being redeemed and returned to our former estate. And so with that, I'm going to share with you the second portion of the book of the Gospel of Gamaliel. And tomorrow, uh, or whenever I have access to the archives, I will upload it as a series and present it to those of you that are interested, give you an opportunity to examine it in a manner which most of you have never heard of before and never had chance to read or examine. And so um, it, it's my opinion that you will be blessed by this text and that if you really listen and you really study and examine it, that it will give you greater insight into the passion of Christ and that which had happened to him. Because um, still so many, you know, have little knowledge of the deeper aspects of this theme as it played out in his life and what he had overcome and what what was established through him that really has become the core the core tenet of our faith and what is you know the largest faith on really in my opinion the face of of the earth and the reason being is because it is the one the one true faith which shows that you know he is our way home and he is it is through him that we have chance to be redeemed and to live forevermore and so the gospel of Gamaliel the second portion of the text is the martyrdom of Pontius Pilate. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, we will begin with the help and assistance of God to write the history of Pilate, the governor of the city of Jerusalem. May his prayers be with the children of baptism. Amen. A treatise composed by the holy Syriacus, bishop of the town of Behanasa, on the resurrection of our Lord from the dead and on the tribulations undergone by Pontius Pilate in the holy city at the time of the crucifixion. In it, he makes mention also of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, the venerable chiefs, and of the persecution suffered by Pilate at the hand of the Jews for the name of Christ, to whom be glory and worship and of the torments inflicted on him by Herod before he was sent by the latter to the metropolis, the great city of Rome, where his head was cut off and his martyrdom completed. 
All right, we'll be right back in one. All right, welcome back, everybody. The show, as always, is just going by so very quickly, but I'm hoping that we can cover a lot of this material this evening because I'm pretty certain that most of you have not heard of the, about this text and that, um, and that there will be great insight into some of the miracles and some of the proceedings which were connected to the Passion of Christ. And for those that don't know, the Passion of Christ was also reflected upon and connected to the celebration of Passover, that he, um, because he was a firstborn son, together with the apostles, they celebrated Passover on what was the 13th, which is why there's confusion in the scriptures as to how he could be the Passover lamb if he is shown in the scriptures as celebrating Passover um, with the Last Supper. And most people don't understand that there is an association and that there was a celebration for the firstborn, which they would celebrate and eat the Passover on the 13th of Nisan, and then they would fast for what is the 14th of Nisan for the coming Sabbath celebration, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is on the 15th of Nisan on the full moon. And so that's why um, there is you know, slight confusion with regard to these two particular feast days and how they connect together um, you know, as far as the, the dating and the timing of it. But, and so I will go into, I'll go into it here and hopefully you'll have a better understanding of how it comes together. Picking up the story. The story is told as found in the copy written by Gamaliel and Horus, the good, pious, and respectable teachers in all things dealing with God. They wrote it because they were present with Joseph and Nicodemus and witnessed the ordeals of Christ, which became the source of our life and his glorious resurrection. They related that they wrote this martyrdom for the prodigies and miracles that took place in the tomb of our Savior. Jesus Christ, consequent upon his resurrection from the dead, and at the end of the machination intrigues of the wicked Jews, may the peace of God be with us. Amen. When our Lord Christ Jesus was crucified in the place called Cranium, which being interpreted means a row of stones, and it is, the, it is Golgotha, the vulnerable chiefs, Joseph and Nicodemus got possession of his body and placed it in a new tomb. The Virgin Mary began then to weep and show a keen desire to go to the tomb of her son, but she could not do so from fear of the Jews because it was the Sabbath day, which follows Friday, and in it no one was allowed to proceed anywhere or to undertake any work. When the morning of Sunday arrived, Mary took with her other women, who carried with them sweet spices and perfumes, and with with which to anoint the tomb of the Savior. And Mary preceded the other women, who followed her to the sepulcher early in the morning. When she reached the sepulcher, she found the stone rolled away from it. And while in a state of amazement, she looked into the place in which lay the body of Jesus, but did not find it. She found, however, the linen clothes lying there, and the napkin that was over the head separated from the linen clothes, and wrapped together in a place by itself. She also saw two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet. While she was weeping, she turned her back and saw the Savior standing, and he said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She, supposing him to be the gardener, answered him, saying, Sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where you have laid him, and I will go and take him away. And the Savior said to her, O oh, Mary. And she answered and said, Rabbani, 
which is to say, my master. You rose, oh my son, and my God, your resurrection is magnificent because you rose and granted salvation to, hum to the humankind. But oh my son and my God, I am amazed at you having allowed these wicked people to inflict on you all these sufferings. And the Savior began. And the Savior said to her, I have already told you all this before it happened. And when his mother heard what he said to her and ascertained that it was he, she rejoiced and wished ardently to go near him and worship him. She was indeed so overjoyed that she thought she was dreaming. But he said to her, do not come near me because I have not gone yet to my father. This is the reason why no corporeal being is able to approach me and to touch me. Go you rather to my brethren and announce to them this joy, which you have witnessed and tell them to go to Galilee where they shall see me. Lo, I have told you. Then the Virgin Mary began to ask the Savior, her son concerning the events that took place at the hands of the wicked Jews on the day of the crucifixion when he was hanging on the wood of the cross and she was standing near him and weeping and he explained to her all the events that she had witnessed one by one. She said to him, Oh, my beloved son, O oh, life of my spirit and master of my soul and body, why did you cry and say on the wood of the cross Eloi, Eloi, why hast thou forsaken me? And also, scripture is fulfilled. And also, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he answered and he said to her, O oh, my beloved mother, I cried to the Father with a sight, with a sigh, like an only son to his father, and asked him to allow me to die in order to redeem with my death the death of Adam, whom sin had killed and whom the sentence of death had cast into Hades. Yes, O oh mother, I cried to the father and implored him to look upon my humiliation and have pity on Adam and grant him another grace. And when I remembered his hunger and thirst, I said, I thirst and asked the father on his behalf to quench his thirst from the water of the eternal life. When my side was pierced with a spear and I drank the cup which all men are bound to drink, I asked the Father that on the day of my rising from the dead, if I might raise Adam from the death of sin, since I was pierced in my side because of him. Oh, my mother, the hierarchies of heaven scoffed at Adam and complained about him to the Father, saying, all this happened to your only son because of an earthly man on whom you breathe the breath of life. The father, however, rebuked them and said, this is the creation of my hand and I love him more than you. Hades complained about him to me and said, let me cast him into the bottom of the pit. But I rebuked it and said, Shut up your mouth. You will no more rise and seize Adam and cast him into the depths. He does not deserve now to be with you for one single hour. I came now to break up and smash your doors and throw you to the lowest depths and to raise Adam to the heights. The tormenting angels of hell, whose habit is this to turn towards the west, began then to vociferate and they kindled fires which they inflamed with pitch and sulfur and shouted concerning the sin of Adam. And I said, let us destroy it. Concerning the sin of Adam and said, let us destroy him and throw him to the great sufferings of the fire of hell. Further, when they heard my conversation with him at the time I was lifted on the wood of the cross and my saying to him, O oh, Adam, it is for your sake that all this has happened to me. They cried and they said, deliver him into our hands, sir, and we will do to him what he rightly deserves and we will destroy him as if he had never existed. But I rebuked them 
and sternly reproved them. And I disclosed to them the fact that I have shed my precious blood for him so that I might save him and give him a share in my kingdom. Oh, my mother, I remember the sadness and the sorrowfulness that fell to the lot of paradise. I recalled, oh, my mother, the mournfulness of paradise and the fact that it was empty from the time in which Adam was driven out of it through my passion and my crucifixion. I meant to thank, I meant to restore Adam to paradise. Did you not know then, O oh my mother, why I remain nine months in your womb? And do you not understand the cause of my coming into this world? Did you not know that the events about which the ancient prophets had prophesied had to take place? Did you not realize that all of this had to happen and that I had to deliver the rest of the captives from the hands of the enemy and bring them out of the prison of Hades? I suffered all what I did in order to elevate the elect to the heights of heaven. I interceded with the Father on their behalf, not only by words, but by the shedding of my blood on the cross before you in order to deliver them and Adam, their father, from the evil consequences of his transgression. I do not hold him, therefore, responsible for the blasphemies uttered against me for his sins, nor answerable for my thirst, for the crown of thorns which was placed on my head, for the hanging of my body on the wood of the cross, and for the death which I accepted for him. On the contrary, I ask the Father to forgive him all his sins. Have patience, O oh my mother, and I will ask the Father to tear up the written document of the slavery of Adam. O oh my mother, what would be the utility of this shedding of my blood on the earth if I did not raise this body to heaven? In this day, the heavenly beings will be reconciled with the terrestrial ones. Go now in joy, O oh my mother, because I rose from the dead. I have demolished the wall of partitions of Hades, and I have opened the door of paradise for the thief at my right. I have also opened the door of heaven before the angels, and they flapped their wings. The archangels girded their loins with their shining and majestic girdles. The heavenly powers danced with hymns and canticles. The cherubim and the seraphim began their glorifications. The dominions desired to contemplate intensely the glory of my divinity. And the thrones stood before the throne. This is what the Savior told his mother near the door of the tomb by way of consolation. He further said to her, no corporal man could touch me because I am clad in an imperishable garment and immortal robe till the time in which I shall descend to my father. When he uttered these words, he disappeared from her sight and recommended her to tell his disciples to go to Galilee where they would see him when the woman returned and narrated to the disciples the words which he had heard from the Savior, they did not believe them, but fear did not allow them to show themselves to anyone until they repaired to Galilee. When Pilate noticed all the miracles and prodigies that emanated from the tomb of the Savior, he went to his house and prepared a great banquet for the poor and the needy on account of the joy that he experienced at the resurrection of the Savior. This was even more so in the case of Procula, his wife, because she loved the Savior intensely on account of what she had seen in her dream concerning him. She had already made preparations to go and see the tomb in which the Savior was placed in order to worship him and know the precious precise spot in which his body was laid. 
A company of Jews, however, became cognizant of her plan and went and apprised their chiefs and proceeding to the tomb, apprised their chiefs and told them that the wife of Pilate was in that very night proceeding to the tomb. These wicked people circulated the news among themselves and after conference decided to lie in wait for her in order to seize her and to kill Pilate. They therefore summoned Barnabas, the robber, and said to him, we do not need to remind you of all the benefications which we have showered on you. We set you free and delivered you from prison against the wish of the governor, and we crucified Jesus of Nazareth in your place. We want you now to accompany us tonight to the tomb of Jesus and to do your best for us. It has come to our knowledge that that wicked foreigner called Pilate wishes to go with his wife and his children to the tomb of Jesus in order to worship him. We will lie in wait for them, and you will help us to kill them, destroy Pilate, and plunder their possessions. The affair appealed to Barnabas and pleased him exceedingly. He desired to possess something as he had come out of prison a pauper and a mendicant. And when he heard, therefore, of possessions to plunder, he was glad because he loved gold and silver. He was the brother of the wife of Judas, who is from the wicked and perverse stock, the seed of Cain. The wife of Barnabas, the sister of Judas, used to urge her husband to ask his master to intervene and to deliver her brother from prison. Judas asked this several times of the Savior, who, however, did not pay any heed to his saying and neglected it because he was aware of what the man was going to be. When the sister noticed that he did not speak on behalf of her brother, she forsook him completely. This was also on account of what her husband used to steal from the bag. She began then to pay visits to the wives of the priests and incite them to crucify the Savior. After this, the wicked company of the Jews resolved to kill Pilate with his wife and his children and to plunder his possessions. When I, Gamaliel, learned the conspiracy of these wicked people, I did not neglect the matter, but I hastened to Joseph of Arimathea, who had shrouded the body of the Savior, and I disclosed to him the conspiracy of the Jews and their evil plot. When he heard it, he hastened to the court and informed Pilate, the governor, of what the Jews had plotted and were about to do to him. Whereupon, Pilate summoned a company of his troops and revealed to them what had taken place. And he informed also the sentinels of the town and told them to be on their guard. Then the God-loving Procula, wife of Pilate, arose in the night took with her her maidservants, her ladies in waiting, and a number of private attendants, and proceeded to the tomb of the Savior. She worshipped in the tomb and spread on it, and also on the wood of the Holy Cross, perfumes of high value and sweet spices of exquisite scent. She then lit up many lamps in the tomb and burned much incense therein. While they were standing near the tomb and the servants of the Jewish priests and a band of men and officers with attendants and a great company from the party of the elders arose and proceeded with the robber Barnabin to the tomb of the Savior and to the spot where the women folk of Pilate were praying. Then the soldiers of Pilate sprang on them with swords, spears, and stones and put them to the sword, seized the robber Barnabin and bound him with fetters and brought him to Pilate. When Pilate saw him, he asked him, Are you the robber Barnabin who I released from prison? And instead of whose blood we shed innocent blood, that innocent blood which we have unjustly shed will not fail to wreak vengeance on the one who acted towards him in an iniquitous way. Today will redound 
on you all the evil, theft, robbery, by violence and homicide, which you have perpetrated in this town, the inhabitants of which chose to release you and ransom you with the blood of Jesus. Now, O oh, wretched and miserable one, God will show his justice towards you today. O oh, robber, the shedding of the blood of Jesus with which they ransomed your own blood will not be slow in avenging itself on you. Then Pilate ordered that they should take Barnabas to the place where the Savior was crucified, that they should crucify him there head downwards that they should pierce him with a spear before he expired, and that they should break the bones of his legs in order that he might die quickly. On account of all the untruthfulness told by his people, the soldiers of Pilate took him, did with him what Pilate had ordered, and killed him five days after the resurrection of the Savior. When this took place, the Jewish people became incensed against Pilate and began to say one to another, Conrad's Barnabas has gone from us and Pilate is left. Come, let us write a report about Pilate from King Herod to the emperor Tiberius Caesar and ask him to kill him for us. We will give three talents of gold to Herod in order that he may help us to murder him. Many Jews then, men and women, tore up their clothing, threw ashes on their heads, and repaired to King Herod in Galilee. They began to vociferate, and their clamor reached such a pitch that the town was in a state of commotion. They shouted and said, How is it that we have no king today except Pilate, the foreigner who is from the land of Egypt? And they clamored and said, he has thwarted and despised the injunctions of the king, changed our habits and customs, and destroyed the laws of our fathers in conjunction with Joseph and Nicodemus. How is it that all power has gone from Herod? We ask your majesty as our king to deliver us from him. He has killed Barnabas whom you had ordered to be released from prison on account of his courage and valor in his fight for the king and his endeavor to defeat the king's enemies. He did all this without consulting the king and on the advice of Joseph and Nicodemus. Now you are competent to judge between us and him and to write and inform the emperor Caesar of his affair and all that he did to us for the sake of Jesus of Nazareth. Herod became then incensed against Pilate and wrote about him many lying things which he sent to Tiberius Caesar and dispatched with his report men of high standing among the Jews in order to render his report more effective. It happened that the letters of Herod preceded those of Pilate by one day. The Jews read them to the emperor with all the slanders and iniquitous testimonies which they contained and asked him to kill Pilate and his confederates. In the morning, the letters of Pilate reached the emperor, and in them was an account of the deeds of Jesus, his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection from the dead, the quaking of the earth, the eclipse of the sun, and the destruction of the idols and their falling from their thrones on the day of his crucifixion. When the emperor Tiberius read and heard what the Jews had done to the Savior at his crucifixion, he wept on account of the deep sorrow that he felt. And when he reached the place in which were the names of the heads of the Jews who were the cause of the crucifixion of Jesus, he found that some of them were among those who had come on the day of his crucifixion. When the emperor Tiberius read and heard what the Jews had done to the Savior, I'm sorry, I read this part. I'll read. All right, we'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody, for second hour. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is uh, 
Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio, and this is a two-part in a series on the Gospel of Gamaliel. And we are speaking in this show about the Passion of Christ and the, His resurrection and the miracles and things which were experienced thereafter. And as I said in the show that I began last evening, this two-part text is the most in-depth manuscript on the Passion of Christ and gives greater clarity as to what had occurred over the course of this time and these this particular event. And it describes it in really great detail, so much so that a lot of things which are not revealed in the other gospel narratives uh, really come to light. And for instance, those of us that read even the gospel narrative, we believe that Mary Magdalene was the first person to whom the Savior appeared after his resurrection, but this actually is not true. That the first person that he came to and gave words of um, words to soothe was his mother, and that she had gone with John, whereas all of the other apostles had scattered and were afraid um, of the conspiracies of the Jews, that he had gone with her to accompany her to not only the crucifixion, but also to that of, uh, of Christ's burial, and that he also took her into his home as his mother and and as Christ said here is your mother here is your son and so basically he appointed John to take care of the virgin Mary and so anyway that's just one of the things that comes to light within this particular text and then it was thereafter soon thereafter that Mary Magdalene was also uh, witness to, as was Salome, the Virgin Mary's cousin, who was the caretaker of Yeshua during his life. When the Emperor Tiberius read and heard what the Jews had done to the Savior at his crucifixion, he wept on account of the deep sorrow that he felt, and when he reached the place in which were the names of the heads of the Jews, who were the cause of the crucifixion of Jesus, he found that some of them were among those who had come to him in order to vent their grievances about Pilate. He therefore summoned them before him and said to them, O chiefs of iniquity, here is the letter of Pilate, and he is testifying against you that it was you who crucified Jesus of Nazareth. I will order now that none of you be left alive in the world on account of your cruel deeds to Jesus. He ordered, therefore, that they should be killed and their bodies be hung on the heights that surmounted the gates of the city. And then he sent a messenger after Pilate and summoned him before him in order that he might tell him the truth concerning the miracles that emanated from the tomb of the Savior. When the messenger of the emperor reached Jerusalem, the chiefs of the Jews assembled and went to Herod and the prized him of the arrival of the messenger of the emperor for the purpose of summoning Pilate, Joseph, and Nicodemus. They spoke to him out of their spite and jealousy and told him that they would bribe the messenger if he would kill Pilate. But he said to them that he was unable to do so without the sanction of the emperor. In the morning, Herod came to Jerusalem to have a word with Pilate on the affair. When Pilate heard this, he went to his wife and said to her, O oh, my sister Procula, I arise and hide in a place on account of what Herod is going to do to me. The mob, the heads of the Jewish people, and the messenger of the emperor have come. I do not know if they have come to take off my head or to torment me for the sake of the Savior. Arise, you, take your children, and go out of this town, 
Watch, however, over my body if they are bent on taking off my head. Give silver to the soldiers and redeem my body from them. Shroud it and place it in the tomb of my Lord Jesus in order that his grace may overtake me. Do this even if you have to give all my possession for the purpose. When his wife heard these words, she tore up her garments and began to pluck the hair of her head, saying, What are these words you are uttering to me, my Lord Pilate? Have I not sufficient pain in my heart on account of what you did with Jesus and crucifying him? To tell you the truth, O oh brother, you have comforted my heart today in apprising me of your possible death. If God did not spare his only son but delivered him up for us, neither I nor you will flee from death for him. What utility shall we have from our nation? O oh brother, if you love me more than you love him, it is blameworthy. God knows that we are both us one body. And as we did not separate from each other in this world, neither we nor our children should be separated, the one from the other in the kingdom of heaven. While Procula, the wife of Pilate, was saying this, the troops came and surrounded him and took him to the court of Herod in the presence of the messenger of the emperor who said, Are you Pilate who said there is no hand over my hand? How did you kill this Jesus without consulting the emperor? Pilate did not give him any answer to this question, but only said, My Lord, if these have so little fear of God as to crucify his beloved son, I am prepared to die for his holy name. I have faith that if I die for his name, I shall possess the eternal life and you will not impede me from his glory. The Jewish people said then to the messengers of the emperor, what is the utility of speaking to him while he insults you in the Coptic language? Immediately after the envoy of the emperor gave orders that he should be stripped of his clothes, that a napkin should be tied around his loins, and that he should be flagellated with a rough whip. Herod incited them to flog him well, and the Jewish people said, O oh, Pilate, all the sufferings you inflicted on Barnabas have now come back on your own head. You prided yourself and said that you were the governor and the emperor. Now no power of any kind remains to you in the city of Jerusalem. Pilate bore with patience this taunt while he was being flogged with the whip and his innocent blood flowed profusely on the ground before them like flowing water. Then his wife, Procula, hastened and came to him and began to urge and encourage him, saying, O oh, martyr, O oh, my brother Pilate, how I wish to die with the death with which you will die. The Jews seized her immediately with her hair and threw her before her husband in order to intensify his affront and indignity. The holy Procula, however, was jubilant in her heart and began to say, O oh, my brother Pilate, the beginning of this first honor that came to me, I offer to Christ and to his holy name. The Jews then said to Pilate, Know that this punishment which is inflicted on you is not for what you have done to Jesus of Nazareth, but for your murdering of Barnabas. And he replied to them, Would that I could be found worthy to be crucified with my wife and children for the name of Jesus, and that he could be left alive to me. But I believe, rather, I am sure of the fact that he is alive and that he has eternal life, which he imparts to all believers in him. The Jews answered him and said, O oh, Pilate, your life is like his life, and your lot is similar to his lot. And he said, Amen. My life is with him, and his judgment will be on you and your children. The Jews then sprang upon him, and some of them slapped him, some others struck him on the face, and some others insulted him and reviled him saying, we will not release you until you die on the wood like your God, Jesus. 
when the messenger of the emperor noticed the intensity of their hatred against him, he took him from their hands and said to them, the emperor has not permitted me to do this, nor has he been ordered me to torture him and to kill him until I have brought him before him. The Jews, however, satisfied him with much money and said to him, kill him and this, his affair will not reach the ears of the emperor. And they asked him to give them permission to drag him in the streets of the town bound with fetters and accompanied by his bareheaded wife. And this was granted to them. How bitter was the weeping in Jerusalem when people saw Pilate and his wife with their hands bound with fetters behind their back and dragged in the streets while the Jews were applauding and saying, this is like the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. When the hirelings were tired of the work of dragging, they threw them in prison while still bound with iron fetters, but beaming with joy. Then the false witnesses and teachers of error sat and wrote many lies about Pilate, saying, This is Pilate who said, There is no hand over my hand and no other king beside me. This is Pilate who abrogated our prescriptions. This is the one who demolished our synagogues in which people read the law and the commandments. This is the one who killed the indomitable Barnabas. When they wrote this, they began to bring accusations against Joseph and Nicodemus, and they brought them bound with fetters before Herod, as they had done with Pilate. He ordered them to be flogged and their possessions plundered like Pilate, and they were so much weakened by scourging and so impoverished that they resembled Job at the time of his poverty. Then the iniquitous Jews sat and conspired together to burn the tomb of the Savior on account of the prodigies and miracles that they saw emanating from it, and they asked for the wood of the cross to be burnt likewise. Joseph, however, had taken it and placed it in a hidden place in the sepulcher. The Jews therefore brought fire, which they kindled round the sepulcher, but it did no harm of any kind to it, nor did it reach it. And to hide their shame, they hid the entrance of the sepulcher and placed a stone over it in order that no one might penetrate into it. The Jews did all this. When Pilate and his wife and Joseph and Nicodemus were in prison, Herod asked the messenger of the emperor to empower him to send Joseph and Nicodemus to their own town and bank and to kill them therein. But the messenger of the emperor did not allow them to do so. Then the Jews asked Herod to secure for them from the messengers of the emperor a permit which would allow them to crucify Pilate like his master. And when they bribed him with much money, he delivered Pilate to them in order that they might crucify him and kill him. While they had conspired thus to kill Pilate with his wife and his children, Lo, the keepers of the prison came to Pilate, shaking and trembling. They began to implore the messengers of the emperor, saying, O oh, our Lord, the vizier, either do with Pilate what you have intended to do with him, or take him away from us. From the time you have ordered him to be in prison with his wife, they have not been left alone. But a spiritual man is constantly with them whose light is more dazzling even than that of the sun. We saw him coming down from heaven and embracing them, after which the fetters and shackles with which they were bound were torn up, and their iron melted like water from their feet. Further, the column to which they were tied bent down and worshipped that spiritual being, and is even now in that bent state inclining to the ground. Then they asked them and said, What is the description of that man? And they answered, He is a Galilean by appearance, and his hair is beautiful and flowing in curls round him. He spoke at a great length with Pilate and his wife and said to him, O oh, Pilate, you shall be crucified on the wood of the cross like me, and they shall place a crown of thorns on your head like me, but they will not be able to kill you here. They will take you to the emperor Tiberius, before whom you will stand and who will order you to be crucified a second time. They were also having much intimate conversation with each other. 
when the Jews heard these words from the Galileans, an intense fear seized them and their hearts palpitated. They began to say to one another, even if they kill us and kill our children, we will kill and crucify Pilate. Then Herod enjoined the Galileans not to repeat these words before anybody else until Pilate was killed. When Pilate heard these words, he was greatly pleased. Meanwhile, the Jews advanced much silver to the messenger of the emperor, and it amounted to such a quantity that it carried conviction, and he allowed them to crucify him. Then they rushed like mad dogs to the gal in order to take him out and crucify him. When they, when they entered the gal, they found him smiling and joyful while the fetters were loosed from him and from his wife and the column was leaning towards the ground like a tree bent by the force of the wind. The Jews took then Pilate and his wife and brought them to the open court. They stripped him of his garments, tied a napkin around his waist to cover his nudity and began to march them through all the city until they reached the spot where they had crucified the two malefactors and they crucified him there. God, however, who is full of mercy, inculcated forgetfulness into the mind of the Jews so that none of them stretched an evil hand towards the wife of Pilate. Indeed, she was standing near him, urging him, encouraging him, saying, Oh, my brother Pilate, remember the one who comforted you and came to you in this very night. Endure and bear your tribulations for his name. And when they were intending to lift him up on the cross, they remembered the cross of the Savior, and for this they immediately opened the sepulcher and took the wood of the cross and crucified Pilate on it. They fastened him tightly on it with nails, placed on his head a crown of thorns, arrayed him in a purple garment, and began to pierce his side with the spear while shouting and saying, O Pilate, disciple of Jesus of Nazareth, if your master has risen from the dead, come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. The blessed Pilate began to pray while hanging on the cross and said, Oh, my Lord, I have polluted your holy cross by the hanging of my body on it, because it is a pure wood and my body is an impure body. Your blood is an innocent blood, and my blood is carnal. I do not weep now, O oh my Lord, because I have been crucified for your name, but I weep because I have defiled and polluted your holy cross. I do not sigh, O oh my Lord, for help, but I shed tears because you have borne all these sufferings for us sinners. I do not weep, O oh my Lord, because they have crucified me. Have pity on me, your sinning servant, who has been lifted up on your holy cross as I am not worthy of all these benefits. I do not sigh because of my nudity, but I weep for your deep humility and self-effacement. Now I ask you, O oh my Lord Jesus Christ, not in my own name, but for the glory of your majesty and the honor of your cross to grant rest and a happy lot to my poor soul. Grant rest to me, your servant Pilate, to your maidservant Procula, and to my children in the day in which you will come to judge the world. This is what Pilate said, and his God-loving wife, Procula, approached him, kissed his legs while he was hanging on the wood of the cross, and said, Why are you weeping on the wood of the cross? You are ahead of us in sitting before the throne of the judge. You are ahead of us in lighting your lamp at the wedding of your Lord Jesus Christ. You are ahead of us, O oh my brother Pilate, in lying in the banquet of a thousand years. You are ahead of us in wearing the diadem of the king in the dignified law court of judgment. Blessed are you, O oh Pilate, for having been lifted up on the wood of the cross and this lifting will make you worthy of sitting in the kingdom. This is what the blessed Procula said under the cross while all eyes were gazing at her.
She further said, you have preceded us and sat before the throne of judgment. Now you have lit your lamps in the wedding of your master. And the Jews began to rail and scoff at her. And at night, Pilate, and that night, Pilate. Then two crowns came down from heaven equal to each other in glory and majesty. And a voice from heaven was heard saying, no, O Pilate and Proculia, that you will be crowned with these two crowns that came down to you from heaven. Because of the sufferings you have borne for your God and your great faith in him. Then the two crowns disappeared and went up to heaven. When the multitudes noticed this miracle, they hastened and brought down Pilate from the cross alive. Then they heated water for him and washed his body with it, after which they put on him garments and brought him and his wife Procula to the messenger of the emperor and said, if the emperor has sent you to destroy this city, listen to the cruel Herod. You do not know his great cunning and machinations. He became jealous of his brother, took his wife Herodia from him, and killed him with hunger and thirst through the hatred and cruelty that are in him. Do you not see what he did in the city in these days? He killed a just man because of his own sympathy with the Jews and God wishes to destroy us all because of him. What advantage will ever come to Jerusalem if you allowed Pilate, its governor, to be murdered in it? Truth to tell is Herod that deserves death instead of Pilate. If the emperor was aware of the deeds of Herod, he would not have empowered him to rule over the city and to torment Pilate and his wife. After all, the affairs of the city are in the hands of the emperor. And Herod has neither a word to say in the matter, nor power and jurisdiction of any kind over us. When the vizier heard these words from the multitude, he was pleased with them, and he released Pilate until he had brought his case before the emperor. Now the emperor had an only son whom he loved tenderly, more than all his kingdom. It happened that the boy went into a bath to wash, and an evil spirit entered there into him, strangled him, and threw him to the ground dead. His father and mother came to him with intense grief in order to take him and bury him. And they buried him near them and wailed and wept over him night and day for three complete months. One day when the emperor was sitting wailing and weeping over the loss of his son, his wife came down to him, bowed before him, and said to him, Oh, my Lord. We have had much sorrow, and our bereavement has affected our brain. And the emperor said to her, And now has our brain been affected? And how has our brain been affected? And she replied to him and said, Oh, my Lord, I recall that some time ago the inhabitants of Jerusalem sent to you a letter concerning a certain Jesus of Nazareth, whom the Jews had crucified. And they reported that he had raised dead men while he was alive. And Pilate, also the governor of the town, wrote to you in letter in which he registered the miracles and prodigies which he had wrought. He told us that he had raised up the dead, healed the cripples and the sick, opened the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf. He further added that many miracles and prodigies were taking place even now at his tomb. This is the reason why I said that we have been stupid, that we have been struck with forgetfulness and our own brain has been affected. Indeed, if we had sent our son when he died to his tomb, he would have been alive now. When the emperor heard these words, he rose from his forgetfulness and remained for a longing in a state of confusion, meditating over the words of his wife. Then he immediately summoned his faithful servants and enjoined them to fill the vessels with gifts to be sent to Jerusalem. He also dispatched brave and courageous men to the tomb of his son, which they may open, and which they took the coffin that contained the body and brought it to the father. When he saw that the flesh of his limbs had suffered putrefaction and disappeared and that 
there was nothing left from his body but the bones. He and his wife wept bitterly for a long time. All right, we'll be right back for final segment. All right, welcome back, everybody, for final segment. Um, and uh, just give a shout out to everybody in the chat room. I appreciate all of you and thank you for always tuning in and supporting our work and uh, being interested in these texts, in these ancient manuscripts, and of having a love for the truth and of wanting to know uh, the greater details of the fullness of the story of the passion of Christ. Anyways, I, I greatly appreciate you. I'm going to get back into this text and try to finish up what I can. But the you, the next aspect of the story is going to amaze you. When he saw that all the flesh of his limbs had suffered putrefaction and disappeared and that nothing was left from his body, but the bones, he and his wife wept bitterly for a long time. Then he took ink, pen, and papyrus and wrote as follows. Tiberius, the emperor of the earth and the servant of the king of heaven, asks you and implores your love. Oh, my Lord, Jesus Christ, whom I do not know at all, whom I did not perceive and to whom I have never had the honor and the worth to speak. A man named Pilate bore witness to the miracles which you wrought and reported that you rose from the dead, and I believed his words. He told me that you gave sight to the blind, and I believed this about your... And he mentioned to me that you made wine out of water, and I did not doubt it from you. He wrote also to me that you raised from the dead a man called Lazarus four days after he had died. And I became convinced in my mind that you had done it. He also testified and said that the miracles which you wrought, the tomb in which your body is laid, was also working them. I believed in you and was convinced that you are the Son of God. As you are in heaven, so also you are on the earth and in the tomb. Now, O oh my Lord, have pity on the weakness of your servant Tiberius. Remember him with your grace and have mercy on the wretchedness of Caesar, my son and your servant, whom I have sent to your tomb. Grant him life, O oh my Lord and my God. I heard that you were the resurrection and the life to all the dead from Adam till now. I believe that you have suffered pains in order to deliver the sons of men from the hands of the enemy. If you will, let your grace overtake me. Amen. After the emperor had written this letter, he sealed and sent it to his messenger in Jerusalem. He also said to his faithful servants, inform yourselves about the tomb of Jesus whom the Jews have crucified in which they placed his body and from which he rose the third day and lay the body of my son in it. I have faith that my son, whom I am sending dead in a coffin to Jerusalem, will come back to me alive. And they departed and reached Jerusalem with the letter of the emperor and the dead body of his son, accompanied by thousands of attendants, female servants and male servants, and they went to Herod and the messenger of the emperor. At that time, Pilate and his wife were in prison. In the night, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to them a second time and said to Pilate, Peace be with you, O Pilate. Peace be with you, and you may, you may, whose name was the first to be pronounced by the Father's mouth of life. It is inevitable that you should be judged in the court of the emperor Tiberius. Now is the word of the Father, word of the Father fulfilled. Because I stood before you and you sat and judged me. Be not grieved, O Pilate, because they have crucified you for me, since this has saved you from your sin and from the act of your scoffing at me. You have been flagellated, O Pilate, in order that you might be redeemed of the sin of my flagellation, which you ordered. 
Your blood has been shed, O Pilate, in order that you might be purified from the sin of the shedding of my blood. You have been lifted up on the wood of the cross, O Pilate, in order that you might be saved from the sin of your saying to the Jews, Take ye him and crucify him. They have stripped you of your garments, O Pilate, in order that you might be absolved from the sin of the stripping of my garments. They have placed a crown of thorns on your head, O Pilate, in order that you might be saved from the punishment of the crown of thorns that your soldiers placed on my head. You have been dragged in the streets of the town, O Pilate, in order that you might be saved from the sin of my carrying the cross which you ordered while in the seat of judgment. Everything that has happened to you is for the sole reason that you may be saved from the sin of my death. As to your God-loving wife, Procula, tell her not to grieve at the fact that they took her bareheaded. As my own mother Mary was rendered bareheaded in the town of Jerusalem on the day of my death, all the inhabitants of the earth with their offerings and sacrifices are not worth a tome, a single hair of my mother's head, O Pilate. Tell your wife, Procula, not to grieve at the fact that they took her out of her palace, and the inhabitants of the town saw her bareheaded, as Mary, my own mother, took me also from country to country and from town to town and experienced the pains, Pilate. As your wife, Procula, comforted you with her words at the time of your crucifixion, so my beloved mother comforted me with her words while I was hanging on the wood of the cross and said to me, I convey you peace, O oh my beloved son, and light of my eyes. Now, O oh Pilate, do not be afraid, because it is inevitable that you should enter into another fight for me near Tiberius Caesar, and here is a sign for you to this effect. Caesar, the son of the emperor, has arrived here. His father sent him here dead out of his great faith. They will soon summon you and deliver you from prison. Take him to the tomb in which my body was laid. And as I gave life to Lazarus and to the son of the widow in the town of Nain, so I will give life to this boy because of his father's faith. Grow cheerful, O Pilate, and fight for my resurrection. The Savior spoke these words to Pilate and disappeared from his sight. When they brought the son of the emperor and the vizier saw that he was dead and that he was accompanied by a considerable army of soldiers. He and all the town of Jerusalem were frightened because they believed that he had died on the way. They were terrified lest the emperor should order the town to be burnt and its heavens destroyed. But when they perused the letter of the emperor, they were struck by the depth of his humility and the greatness of his faith and were much astonished. When Herod and the Jewish community heard this news, they feared that the son of the emperor should rise and live again. And they conspired with the guards who were keeping watch over the body of the son of the emperor and gave them much gold and silver in order that they might allow them to take his body stealthily and hide it. And the wicked community accomplished what they had conceived. When Pilate was freed from prison, for the sake of placing the body of the son of the emperor in the tomb of the Savior in company with Joseph and Nicodemus, a Jew came by stealth in the darkness of the night and stole the body of the son of the emperor from the coffin at the command of Herod and the, the priests. In the morning, then they sought the body of the son of the emperor and did not find it. All the city was thrown into confusion. And the heads of the Jews assembled and went the messengers of the emperor and told him that no one could have done this but Pilate, Joseph, and Nicodemus. When the vizier heard these words, he took Joseph and Nicodemus and scourged them. But no one laid harmful hands on Pilate, because the people who had witnessed his crucifixion had noticed the crowns that had come down from heaven for him and his wife. While Joseph and Nicodemus were bound with fetters and in the power of Herod, Gabriel, the head of the angels, came down from heaven and extended his wings over them, and all the place shone with light. They and he began to speak to them. 
saying, I am the angel Gabriel, who took the head of John away from the wicked Herod, the father of the present iniquitous king, and proclaimed his sin in all the world. I will now destroy this wicked Herod, and he will die of the pains and hunger which he will experience, and vermin will breed in his body like his father. As to you, O Joseph and Nicodemus, here is what the Lord says. Your sufferings resembled my sufferings. You became martyrs, and I too was a martyr. It is I who delivered you from destruction at the hands of the wicked ones, and it is I who enjoined the clouds to remove you and delivered you from their hands. It is I, however, imperative that you should stand before the emperor as to the body of the son of the emperor, which the heads of the Jews have concealed in order that the glory of the Christ might not be made manifest. I shall disclose its hiding place and bring it before the people. This is what the angel Gabriel told the venerable chiefs Joseph and Nicodemus, and these two blessed ones sent for me in secret, me, Gamaliel, and narrated to me what the angel had spoke unto them, because I, the weak Gamaliel, was the disciple of these blessed ones. When I left them, I noticed a great commotion in the town where the people were saying to one another that the coffin containing the body of the son of the emperor had been discovered in a Jewish house and that the reason for stealing the body was to inculpate Pilate and discredit the resurrection of our Lord. The news spread in all the town that Herod and the high priest of the Jews had connived and stolen the body of the son of the emperor. In the meantime, the archangel Gabriel removed the body of the son of the emperor from the palace in which it was hidden and brought it and placed it before the vizier and disappeared. At that very moment, the vizier was incensed against Herod, and he threw an arrow at him, which caused him much pain. His body bred worms, and he died from the intensity of his pain. As to the Jews who had hidden the body of the son of the emperor, their houses were burnt together with their sons and daughters, and in this way they died an ignominious death, more ignominious than that of all men. The vizier took them then Joseph and Nicodemus from prison and handed them the body of the son of the emperor and his coffin. He handed also to them the letter of the emperor, and they read it and were amazed at his wisdom, his deep humility and great faith. Then they lifted their eyes to heaven and said, O Lord, our God, O resurrection of the living and the dead, make manifest your power in the son of the emperor, Tiberius, and accept the supplications of his father and have pity on him, as you had pity on the son of the widow in the town of Nain. With your great power, raise his son alive, in order that he may glorify your holy name. Accept, O Lord, the strong faith of his father, as you accepted the strong faith of Mary and Martha, and raise for them their brother Lazarus. Have pity on him, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, and comfort the heart of the father by the resurrection of the son. Give him life and let your holy sepulcher make him live again, in order that his faith in you might be strengthened like the rest, and in order that he may ascertain your resurrection from the dead. The blessed one spoke these words over the coffin of the son of the emperor while dead. Then they took him and placed him in the tomb of the Savior, and adjusted the stone to the door of the tomb, and the son of the emperor remained four days in the tomb with the closed door, and they experienced deep sorrow at his long stay in the tomb and at his not having risen quickly. On the fourth day, however, he rose from the dead. The stone that was at the door of the tomb rolled away backwards, and the guards, terrified at the sight, went in haste to Pilate and began shouting and saying, Come, our Lord Pilate, and see how the son of the emperor who was in the tomb of Jesus has risen and how the stone rolled away without the help of a human hand. Pilate then bowed himself to the ground together with Joseph and Nicodemus and worshipped in great joy. Then they, all of them, with the vizier of the emperor and all the army, repaired to the tomb of the Savior, and they observed that Caesar, the son of the emperor, had risen and was sitting over the coffin in which his body lay. He appeared bewildered with eyes fixed on the royal garment, 
which he was wearing. They cried to him saying, O Caesar, come out with the power of the one who raised you. Let our joy be perfect in this day as in the day in which our Savior rose from the dead. At that very moment, he jumped and came out of the tomb and sat on the stone. And then the vizier of his father approached him, bowed down and worshiped before him and said to him, Oh, my Lord, what happened to you? And why are you in a state of stupefaction? And he answered, saying, I am bewildered at the greatness of the glory, the kingdom, and the power of my Lord Jesus Christ, who raised me from the dead. And I do not see the like of him in any one of the men that are standing here, nor do I see in them anything like his majesty, his glory. And his majesty are indeed great. What is the honor of my father in comparison with this king? This is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. What is the diadem of my father in comparison with his glory and the light of his cross? What are the sweet scents of my father in comparison with the sublime perfume that exhales from this Jesus? All the rulers of the earth cannot live after their death, but this powerful ruler, Jesus, has the power to do it. No one fears any king after he dies, but this Jesus, King of Kings, all the angels, human beings, and demons fear his name, and the doors of hell tremble from their dread of him. All the tormenting spirits who take the souls of the wicked ones and who are more wicked than the beasts of prey, dragons and vipers, I saw that they were terrified when a voice came to them saying, Jesus orders you to take up this soul from amongst you because he wants it. They did not see him, but only heard the one who pronounced his name. I was then taken forthwith out of the torments in which I was lying. And he called me by my name saying, O oh, Caesar, rise up. I have given you to your parents on account of their faith in me. And in order that they might fight for my resurrection, then he placed his cross on the coffin in which I was lying, and my bones adhered to one another, and my soul recognized this body. When my soul was united to my body, I experienced a great joy, but fear overtook me after that lest he should deliver me again to them. This is what the son of the emperor said while sitting on the stone that was placed on the tomb of the Savior. Then he asked those who were standing near him, saying, what is the name of this town? And they answered him, Jerusalem. Then he inquired about his father and mother, and they informed him that they were alive and that they were in the capital in the, of the empire. After this, Pilate, Joseph, and Nicodemus cried and said, Honor and glory be to you, our Lord Jesus Christ, you who have revived dead bones and given life to those who love you. When the vizier noticed what had taken place, he went to a dung heap and began to throw earth and ashes on his head in a sign of deep sorrow that he felt at his treatment of Pilate and his wife. And then he kissed the head of Pilate and asked forgiveness from him and his companions and wept bitterly on the tomb of the Savior on account of the magnitude of the miracle that had taken place in the person of the dead man who was now standing alive. Immediately after the vizier began to write a report to the emperor and informed him that his son, who was dead, was now speaking to him and announced to him the great joy of the recitation of his son Caesar and his resurrection from the dead. Then the vizier handed also Papyrus to his master, the son of the emperor, and asked him to write himself to his father in his own handwriting. And he wrote as follows, I, Caesar son of the emperor Tiberius, was dead like the rest of mankind, and my body was decomposed and became earth in the grave, in which it lay for three months. The greatness of your faith sent me to Jerusalem, hoping that I will rise from the dead by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have now risen from the dead. My eyes saw the Lord Jesus in the flesh, which he took from the Virgin Mary, and he is an ineffable and indescribable glory. He called me by my name, saying, O Caesar, arise now and stand up alive and become the beginning of the resurrection of the dead. He then took me out of the hand of the death, and his voice gave life to my body. He bestowed on you this great gift of my life, 
Oh, my Father, because of your great confidence and faith in him. And he has raised me in order that you might increase in the glorification of his majesty. I greet you, O Emperor, my Father, my hand which had suffered putrefaction in the grave and the fingers on which had dissolved into earth is writing to you this greeting. The letter was handed to a courier who preceded Caesar to his father and announced a great joy to him. When the missive reached the emperor, he read it, and when he reached it in the passages in which it said, your son who was dead is writing this to you with his own hand, and the omnipotent Lord raised me from the dead in Jerusalem. He was immediately bewildered and confused like Jacob when he received the intelligence that his son was alive. And he began to say to himself, is it possible that my son is alive? Is this news true? Then he went to his wife and read to her the letter of her son Caesar, in which it was written that Jesus raised him from the dead. The queen threw then from her the dignity of the wives of the kings when she heard that her son was alive and became like a lioness. They called the courier who earned the letter, and they said to him, be careful to speak the truth and to tell us the story of our son exactly as was written that Jesus raised him from the dead. Life or death are placed before you as the result of your words. If we see the face of our son another time, we will crown you with the crown of the kingdom and give you much money. But if we do not see the face of our son, your only reward with us will be sword and death. Go now to prison until we see the outcome of your words. The emperor did not neglect the affair of his son, but dispatched immediately other couriers to ascertain whether what had been said concerning his son was true or not. The couriers of the emperor took the way of Jerusalem and found out that the son of the emperor and his army were coming to the emperor. The couriers of the emperor delivered them to Caesar the letter of his father Tiberius. Astonished at what they saw, they proceeded to the capital which they reached one day before the entry of the son, the emperor, and early next morning the son of the emperor arrived. Who would describe the great joy and the sublime spectacle of that day? When the emperor heard of the presence of his son, he went out to meet him with so much haste that all the town was in such a state of commotion, especially when its inhabitants noticed the emperor walking on his feet to go to his son and exult him with joy because he was going to meet him. When he saw his face, he began to cry and weep from joy, saying, Glory be to you, O Jesus of Nazareth, O God of earth and heaven, who vivified the bones that had suffered dissolution. Your grace overtook me today because you raised my son from the dead. I am today as if I had seen the Lord Jesus. And although I shall confess and believe every day, in you and in your great power today, the belief of my heart is more intense. Uh, this will be the last passage. The res resurrection of Lazarus from the dead in Bethany four days after his death was not so wonderful, oh my Lord, because you were with him on the earth. The great wonder is that you raised my son Caesar three months after his death. This miracle is also greater than that you wrought for the son of the widow in the town of Nain because you were before the buyer, and you raised him before his descent into the grave. The grace that you have granted me, O my Lord, is greater than that which you granted to Jacob when he was told that his son Joseph was alive, and he went to him and saw him. My son remained three months in the grave, and by your power you raised him from the dead. This is what the emperor said with a heart brimming with joy while embracing his risen son, then he said to his son, O Caesar, my son, I am as joyful today as if I had seen the Savior rising from the dead and raising my son for me. The miracles which I heard he was working, I see them today with my own eyes. Then the father ordered that his son should ride in a litter. And he cried, saying, O Lord Jesus Christ, who was crucified, who rose from the dead and raised my son for me. How great was the joy of the town when they saw that the one who was dead, had risen from the dead after a death of three months. There was also much sighing, singing, and jubilation before and after him while he was writing. 
Um, I'll, I'm going to do one more show on this to finish the rest of the story because uh, we have the account of Caesar in his own words describing what had happened to him and how he was pulled out of the pit of Sheol. And then we have the remaining, um, the martyrdom of Pilate, which, you know, this whole story, again, is something that is not covered and not spoken about and little known about. God bless all. May you have a blessed Passover. Until next week. Love.